There is a tendency in humans for hero worship, which induces the people to fabricate myths and legends about national and religious heroes. This phenomenon is evident in the story of Alexander the Great. While Alexander was a brilliant military leader, his legend often overlooks the brutal tactics, significant resistance, and logistical challenges he faced. His relentless drive led to the destructions of cities and subjugation of peoples. Stories of his expeditions portray him as a heroic explorer, venturing into unknown lands. Yet, these narratives often obscure the harsh realities and violence of his campaigns, particularly in India. This myth-making has also affected how the events related to the Elbaith are recounted. For example, legends have circulated about the valor and bravery of Hazrat Abu Fadl al-Abbas. They have made fables of his fighting in the Battle of Safin. They say that he threw a man into the air, then another, and so on up to 80 men. And by the time the last man was thrown up, the first one had not yet reached the ground. Then, when the first one came down, he cut him into two halves, then the second, and so on to the last man. And he did all this when he was just 15 years old. Is it logical to believe such a thing? A part of these false narratives of Karbala have resulted from the myth-making tendency. For instance, it is said that the cavalry of the army of Omar ibn Sa'd consisted of 600,000 horsemen and 20 million infantrymen. And this army consisted of men from Syria and Kufa. Now Kufa was a very young city at that time and could not have had more than 100,000 people. So the majority of the army came from Syria. The notion that such a large number of soldiers could have made the journey from Syria in such a short time and could have been assembled on that day and that Hussein ibn Ali should have killed 300,000 of them is not at all reasonable. It is wrong to make legends and myths out of ordinary individuals like Alexander, but in respect of individuals who are guides of mankind and whose words, deeds, stands and uprisings serve as a model and authority, it becomes even more important and imperative to sustain their original personality and character. Because creating these false stories and mythologizing these figures can lead people astray and can make outsiders who aren't familiar with them question the Atul Bay and their character. Another factor is that the focus on making people cry for Imam Hussein has often overshadowed the deeper purpose of reflecting on and understanding his message of justice and sacrifice. This emotional response, while very significant, can sometimes detract from the broader lessons and principles that Imam Hussein's life and his martyrdom were meant to convey. The leaders of our faith, from the time of the noble messenger and the pure imams have commanded in clear terms that the memory of Hussein ibn Ali must be kept alive and that his martyrdom and his ordeals should be commemorated every year. Why? What is the reason underlying this Islamic command? It is because they wanted Imam Hussein's ideology to be kept alive. They wanted Imam Hussein to reappear every year with those sweet, sublime, and heroic summons of his and declare, death is better than a life saddled with indignity. Or to me, death is nothing but felicity and life with oppressors is nothing but disgrace. They wanted to sustain the formative school of Imam Hussein so that the rays of the Husseini spirit may breathe life into this community. Its objective is quite clear. Do not allow the event of Ashura to be consigned to oblivion. Your life, your humanity, and your dignity depend on this event. 
you can keep Islam alive only by its means. That is why they have encouraged us to keep alive the tradition of mourning Imam Hussein, and very rightly. The institution of mourning Imam Hussein has a correct philosophy underlying it, a philosophy which is also extremely sublime. It is fitting that we should do all that we can to endeavour for the sake of this course, provided we understand its purpose and goal. Unfortunately, some people have not understood it. Without making the people understand the philosophy of Imam Hussein's uprising, and without making them understand the station of Imam Hussein in Nadi, they imagine that if they just came and sat in morning assemblies and shed tears without knowledge and without understanding his stance, it would remove their sins. But that is not the case. And creating all these false narratives that are designed to make people cry their eyes out is extremely harmful for the Shia community. For us to fixate on Hazrat Qasim's imaginary wedding or Zafar -e Jinn instead of the real, incredible institution that is Imam Hussein and his movement leads us away from the true essence of his martyrdom and its vital relevance to our lives. And if we keep going down this path, it will completely remove the true essence of Islam from our lives and that of our future generations.